back to the Independent Investor Channel. It's super important for me to continue on this uh, weekly update here as um, there's a few good sources of information online uh, with regard to the, uh, the EV space in general. Uh, I, I think um, in, in some small part or maybe some feel in some large capacity, um, I help in looking to further the, the dialogue and um, that's all I ever am attempting to do. I've had some people come by and say, well, have you seen this channel over here? They're talking this way or that way. Um, I, I don't judge people like that. I, I, I certainly don't judge people through YouTube um, based on what they're looking to do with their strategic opportunity through YouTube. If, if you want to sit back and just criticize, may, maybe you need to come on and, and start your own YouTube channel yourself and start offering your p opinion to the grander masses uh, instead of um, sitting back from a position of convenience and using the, uh, uh, the chat and comment section to, uh, to change the world. Um, I, I don't, um, you know, I, I've endorsed Paul a, a few times on the channel and I've had a few people come back and say, well, he switched gears. I, I don't care. Paul's free to do whatever he, he wants to do. Um, I, I still watch Paul's content. Um, I, I don't hold a grudge if he doesn't watch mine or if, or he does, or if he joins the discord or he doesn't, um, I don't really care. Um, I, I think when I look at Paul's message, um, half of the stuff that he says I'm waiting for him to get into that groove and, and say those things. That's kind of that old Paul that I really liked and um, have followed now for shoot going on a couple of years. Anyway, um, some of the things um, I, I, I think are, are of, uh, of um, you know, a singular approach to how he delivers his message and some things that he says that uh, I think are just an attempt to try to further the dialogue. Um, and I, I think he's well-intentioned. I don't think there's any ill intent at all. Uh, I, I think his passion for the craft is good. I think people need to have uh, a lot more passion for what they do. If this is your thing, great. Um, if your motive is just to come in and, and make money without doing any type of uh, research on your own, uh, great. You, you could probably do just fine. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's going to be people who make their way to this uh, transition in the evolution of how trucking is going to integrate these solutions that are being brought to the forefront now. Each company is working their own niche uh, in their own respective manners. Um, I, I've been critical of Nicola through the past. I have. Um, for you guys that uh, join me on my live stream every Friday, I disclosed to the group that I bought 10 contracts for 2024 uh, at a $7 strike. So over the next couple of years, if Nicola can't pull a dollar of appreciation, um, I won't be in the money on those. Uh, I, I believe that they're going to actually find a niche, just like I believe Hyzon is probably ahead of the pack in all of uh, these uh, avenues. And I, and I think Tesla may be the sleeping bear in this that may have a thing or two to say about their uh, participation in doing something that I think gets missed all the time in this conversation in that Hylion's not doing enough and, and Nikola's doing more or this company's lightning bolts, uh, lightning, you know, light years ahead of the next. And uh, this person's winning the race. This company's doing this. This company's not doing enough. Uh, I, I don't think any of that matters. I don't. Um, do you think it's institutional investors are, are playing that game? I just think it's extremely short-sighted, and unfortunately, it's uh, amongst the retail uh, investing community where, you know, one week somebody will believe one thing, and, and the next week somebody will believe another. I don't invest that way. I don't. I, too, am in this for money as well, but I understand what it takes to get to that end, and sometimes people make up in their mind what it is that they think is the road to profitability and fail to acknowledge that maybe sometimes that vision that you had and how you were going to realize that profit uh, is changed. It's evolved. It's morphed. It's radically changed directions. And maybe it doesn't work out the way that you think that it's going to work out in the short term. Okay. Maybe you need to re-address uh, what your thesis is on why it is that you take the investments that you take in the first place. I think that can really help you with your mental approach to this game. I read comments all the time and I consume social media uh, content a lot with a shit filter, to be honest with you, because um, I don't want that shit getting in my mind and jading my opinion of what I've uh, been 
putting into play for many, many years with regard to my investing discipline and application. I look back on what I've done with Hylion and I would admit quickly that very few people would be able to do what I've done and they would uh, um, be uh, unable to do what I'm going to continue to do into the future. So I don't come onto YouTube to say you should do what I do. As a matter of fact, it's the contrary. Um, I'm looking to share to the best of my ability, my conviction about what I see, because I think where people might suggest and you watch certain videos and you're like, you're right, you've convinced me. I'm going to sell all my Hylion and I'm going to go into Nicola. Is that the goal? Is that the goal to influence people to do one thing or another? I've said many, many times, I don't care what you do. I don't. Um, I, I do this to share my story and nobody can share it like me. <laughs> At least I haven't heard any other highly on channels. I find it ironic that Thomas Healy will not be a visitor on my channel. I find that ironic. A lot of people say, well, you, you pissed off the opportunity, Ryan. Great, fine, whatever. Get over it. It's no problem. I think it's, um, I think it's a real uh, downfall. I think they're missing an opportunity to come on free of charge. They seem to be more than happy with spending all kinds of money on this advertisement that they're doing right now. And I'm happy about it. It's great, but why not exploit multiple opportunities? You know, I'm covering a company right now, which is uh, secure pr uh, private data. And their CEO is all over the place all the time. And it's a $30 million market cap company. And they are just about to critical mass break even on their revenues. Hylion's not even close. So I put those two in a camp. Oh, and the CEO does not draw a paycheck from the company. I just, I, I balance these two things when I look at these companies and, and I look at it from the lens of who's sharing information and the perspectives that exist therein. And I, I agree that Hylion is its own animal. Uh, it will find its place uh, in this uh, path to a greener future. I believe that it will. Obviously, my conviction speaks to that. But when I have social media content creators come out and they say, I don't find a whole lot bullish uh, right now with Hylion, I beg to differ, which is the topic of this video right here. I'm going to share 10 items that I think are absolutely uh, bullish uh, postures on Hylion right now that I think I, I just, I don't hear. I, I wish people would just say, look, I believe that there's nothing bullish about it, but but here's what people are saying about it that are bullish. They don't acknowledge that there might be, I don't know, some inkling of positive information, not only with this company, but all of them. And it doesn't mean that because one company like a Nikola may come out with uh, some positive information, and that's somehow bad for Hylion, that somehow this is a, a race to, to what end, I, I don't know. I think that this is a prolonged evolution of companies that are working on their niche to solve what is right now a transportation industry that is dominated by the fossil fuel industry. And if you want to say, well, the solution is just to do away with all fossil fuel, that way we can go to a cleaner hydrogen future. Um, I think that's probably an escape to thinking as well. And I look to strike and, and parse at the very uh, intermediary solution that I think when people are talking on the fringes, they miss all the time the practical reality of what we have and what these companies are looking to achieve marching toward a greener future. CNG means a greener future, okay? It might not be that carbon-free future, right? It might not be that fossil fuel-free future that you envisioned, but the reality is 95% of the Class 8 space is dominated by diesel. And you would have heard grumblings from the Class 8 space if somehow they could not be, meet their obligation in using 95% of the dominant fuel in what is going right now as the status quo as diesel fuel, the remaining is CNG, right? With methane, uh, excuse me, with uh, compressed natural gas, which is also a, a fossil fuel that comes from the earth. So if we're looking to move toward a greener future, my uh, expectation of these companies is to continue to further the technology in a direction that allows optionality to fleets so that we're, we're not so bound to this 
uh, diesel dominated class eight space. This is, this is my vision. This is what I look to share with you guys all the time. So we kick it off here by talking about the market environment. Why is it such an interesting and fascinating value proposition to look at highly on right now. Uh, let's just call it three dollars and some change. Okay, three twenty-five, I think, uh, three fifteen, something like that. The closing price of shooting this video. It's going to be fun to go back and review these videos when we talked about uh, the company and the the opportunity that exists uh, with the company and the market that we're looking to go after here. I think something that gets missed all the time is. You know, with a three dollars stock price and a hundred shares at three hundred dollars of an investment, very, very anemic to enter into this opportunity right now. And what they're looking to do is penetrate in some capacity a one trillion dollar uh, industry here. Uh, this global industry is a behemoth. Okay. And you might say, well, why not focus on something else? Why not focus on the uh, small passenger, uh, the uh, recreational uh, vehicle space? It's because the class eight space is the number one polluter on the earth. Let me repeat the class eight space is the number one polluter on the earth. So when we're looking at a bullish thesis for a company, is highly on going at this just as a green initiative, right? If, if it was just to clean up or reduce, not drastically reduce, or if advancements had been made in the space that Hylion was looking to, let's just call it augment, okay, we would be having a different, different discussion. But when we look at a status quo, 95% dominated by fossil fuel, let's just call it 100%. I mean, these industries that are working on H2 have zero penetration. Those industries that are looking to exploit CNG and expand upon that have 5% of the total overall market right now. And the technology has their obvious deficiencies in the marketplace. But when we're looking at these companies that are looking to really take hold of this industry, you have to look at it from this perspective and draw your uh, bullish or bearish thesis based on the market that they are looking to go after, okay? And we look at 18 short months as being a, a long way away. Um, I've been actually pleasantly surprised at a couple of things. I've looked at the next 18 months as, be, as being uh, a bridging session, I think, uh, for you investors that are just looking at this thing day to day and it's just driving you up the wall bananas. I think you really need to take a longer term perspective. And I know people are tired of that. They're like, they told me in 2022, it was going to be this in 2021 and this and that. And I know the bears say, well, you ask a highly on investor, you know, why they couldn't deliver in 2021 and they have no answer. It's rationales like that that make me so critical of the retail investing community because the pedigree, the, the very attributes that you're using to uh, uh, place value on an opportunity is just dead ass wrong, okay? And if it makes you feel better to put pop shots on me, no problem. I'm, I'm tough skinned, but I'm telling you, man, that is the wrong application. When you're looking at investing in its core, do you want to invest in a company only to hold them to a standard of perfection? I want you to really think about that for a second. Let me ask another question. Do you feel like there's companies out there that do operate to perfection? Are there perfect companies out there? Warren Buffett would suggest that you should just put all of your money into those perfect companies, right? I.e. an Apple Computers or a Coca-Cola Classic. Okay, I could find deficiencies and, and kinks in those armors as well. But when, when you're looking at these opportunities, make sure that your scrutiny of the company is uh, founded in reality. In other words, Hylion failed to follow through on promises made via the original investor presentation. And therefore, it means that they will never, ever realize in any capacity, not some, not a small, and not a large, but zero in their vision going forward. Do you see how when I put it in that, in that context, it seems to make very little sense to say, okay, you, you got me. Uh, I don't have any explanation as to why they came up with that at the time they came up with it, okay? But it does not mean that 
it's fair to suggest that they won't realize any of those numbers in the future. Just doesn't mean that. Um, could it be a future that they don't realize those those numbers? Sure, anything's possible. Anything's possible. And I think we fail to realize that in investing, people want to make snide comments and they want to take pop shots at people like myself who come on and offer a, the conviction that I do. I've been investing my entire life. What do I know, right? I know just about as, as much as the next person. That's the funny thing, right? Is we always want to put people in a pedestal in the investing world. And I don't think the investing world, uh, I don't, I don't think it needs champions. I don't, I, I think people need to take on the level of risk that they are capable and um, are, are willing to take on for themselves. And that's it. They, they don't need to aspire to the, to the whims and wills of others. They don't need to buy into the recommendations of others. They don't need to do that. You just need to make the best decision at the time that you're making that decision. Put the level of risk on the table that you feel comfortable with, with regard to the conviction that you've made and stick to it. It's really just that sticky nature that retail investors have a really hard time with. Um, and, you know, I've got them that come, I don't want to call anybody out in the community here, man, but, you know, I've got people coming in and they're just like, you know, I, I just put all of my retirement onto Hylion. And I don't mean to say that that's a bad thing. It could be a very lucrative move for this individual. But then I saw the same post on another community post saying, gosh, you've convinced me. I just bought Hylion. Maybe I should sell some Hylion and buy Nicola. This is the very stupidity that I speak about with re retail investors. If you want to do, do it right or don't do it at all. Okay. Don't be wishy washy with your application. You've owned the stock all of 11 days. Okay. You probably tripped and fell into the opportunity of a lifetime because guys like me were buying the stock sub 20, knowing that at some point, this company was going to find a piece of what I consider to be an extremely bullish element of this company. And that is the $1 trillion addressable market, four and a half annual growth rate from now until, uh, until 2025. We're looking to grow at about a four and a half percent clip. We've got about a 300,000 unit changeover per year. And, and, my bet is that Hylion is going to capture some of that market, a small amount, a large amount, a little bit, enough to get by. Here's the thing, guys. I've already provided the framework for you guys. Right now, we're sitting at about 170 order-backed deposits on the Hypertruck ERX, okay? We need to get from zero, which they're obviously off the launching pad with regard to their orders, and we need to get from zero to 5,000 units per year. That's what we need to do. Where they fall in that range is going to be the um, metric that I look at going forward as we monitor the company. Are they going to turn out, are they going to end 2022 with 300 order back uh, deposit order? I don't know. Are they going to finish with 1,000? I don't know. But this is going to be what I look at as we look to approach that critical mass. Can they do it? I believe that they can. And this just speaks to what Hylion is looking to go after when we're looking at building a bullish conviction about it. And I think when you're looking at the addressable market, how can you not discuss this company? If you're choosing not to, then you're choosing not to, okay? I just don't think that you, how you can have the discussion without talking about some of the initiatives that Hylion is looking at right now in rolling out in about 18 short months. Number two, is the technology not to be denied? I think everybody wants to say that one company has better technology than the other. I look at it pragmatically, and here, here it is with my uh, insights to provide clarity for you guys and how I look at this opportunity. Hyzon, I really like the company a lot. I opted to, to go Nikola for the pure play hydrogen fuel cell element. And I think that they have the best chance of actually 
really penetrating that uh, mid-tier market, five, six, and sevens, okay? Um, I, I don't think that they have the technology to penetrate the class eight space outside of local port terminal moves, right? Paul talked about this a little bit uh, where he's domiciled in, in the California market there on the West Coast, uh, which was insightful, uh, somewhat politically driven, yes. I mean, are, do they have the same initiatives there uh, in, um, in, in on the West Coast than they do in a place like Wisconsin, Tennessee, okay? So where you've got that just dynamic support for going all green at the expense of everything, okay? The economics don't matter. As long as we just move away from the, this, this devil fuel, this demon fuel, this diesel thing, and people like that fail to understand that if we remove diesel from the equation, we would have anarchy. Um, we would have um, utter chaos and we would have rioting uh, in the streets if our diesel, our very fossil fuel that we rely on uh, in a very dominant sense was removed from the equation. And I, I think it, it put in that light uh, people who are just completely along the environmentalist uh, chain, which I, I don't mean to be insensitive about it. I care about the planet too. And I think that element plays a part in this. But I think sometimes people offer their opinion and they render it from the opinion to fit the narrative, which means that you cannot have a clean future with CNG as part of that future. And that's just the give and take that I don't, I don't see. I don't speak in definitives that way. I, I've said many times that I believe that the optionality in this market in each of these respective niches is going to be the solution going forward. Thomas Healy has said this many, many times. This is where I agree with them. And do I think that uh, Hylion is going to grab a big piece of that? Well, it's setting up to be that. And I do believe that they will. But do I think it has to be at the expense of a Nikola or Hyzon? No, I don't. The industry is too large. And they're looking at such a small sample pool of niche solutions that I think it's futile su to suggest that, you know, only one is going to come out and dominate and all diesel and CNG is going to go away. And the class eight space is going to be dominated by H2 flying the flag of Nikola. I think that's extremely short-sighted. Um, I say that tongue in cheek. I kind of laugh on the inside saying it because I know that that's not going to happen. I mean, some people claim to have discretion and, and, and they don't. Um, and maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe 20 years from now, we do have a future that's dominated by Nikola. It's my presumption that, we, that, that it's not like that. Do I think Nikola is going to be around in 20 years? I sure do. Do I hope that they're going to be a viable solution in where they are now and where they've evolved to 20 years from now in the technology that they're just now broaching? I mean, the hydrogen technology has been around since 1968, okay? The first hydrogen uh, car or automobile was invented in 1968. So the technology has been around for, every, for a long, long time. Conspiracies would suggest that big oil has somehow suppressed that industry so that they could make all the money. No. <laughs> At the end of the day, guys, it is about the, the, the uh, economics. It is about the science, the economics, and the viability. And oil just so happens to be what has driven the transportation over the last hundred years. Dispute me. That has been what has been the reliable, dependable, available fuel source. It's just that simple. And it's moved us into this era where we've got the technology to start to entertain some of these alternative solutions. And I don't think any of them, because fuel is too valuable as a commodity. It's too valuable. Now we introduce technology on top of the existing science that we have, and it's very, very exciting for a cleaner future. Um, the cloud-based software with Hylion, when we're talking about the technology that surrounds this, the advancement in battery technology, the lower charging times that go into this. You recall Hylion taking a very nice leg up when they announced the eight minute charge, really kind of a futile statistic as far as I'm concerned. And the bears don't chew this up at all. It's not gonna matter if it's constantly being uh, charged on board. 
Okay. I want to understand more about the lifespan of the battery on board. In other words, does it degrade over time? Does it require the generator to kick on more often as it loses its capability to keep a charge? How does the load, uh, the payload, uh, affect the efficiency of the battery? These are all things that we will learn in due time in the short term and medium term as these units are put out to the fleets to be put into the rigor of class eight transportation, right? But when we're looking at the technology here as a, a, bear, a bullish thesis, when we're talking about Hyleon, um, the CEO for Agility ident identified this as well as Dana as really being the, um, uh, the, 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 the real takeaway for Hyleon. This is really the, the diamond in the rough with this company is the ability to build a smarter truck. And I've said this many, many times, the ability to give the uh, idea of when the next fueling opportunity, when they need to stop, when they need to go onto uh, full battery mode uh, in the cities. Uh, this was explained, Paul talked about this a little bit in his video in that um, it was irrelevant in that if the entire future was a hydrogen-based future, that the 75 miles of in the city range uh, would be irrelevant. I agree with that in theory. <laughs> the problem is, Paul, the reality is that they've got to transport goods a long way on a lot of open freeways on I-10 before they get to the port of LA. Okay. And that's where I, I, I beg to differ in looking to strike at the very middle ground here in identifying the use case for all of these solutions. And I think 10 years from now, I think we're going to kind of all laugh at this uh, situation that we're in right now in scrutinizing these technologies to the grind, which I think is great. Uh, I think if we're going to remain positive on the dialogue going forward, I think scrutinizing each and every milestone that these companies have, I think is wonderful. I, I don't think it needs to be at the expense of one or the other. I just think it needs to be chalked up as furthering the discussion and marching toward what I've coined to be a potential in optionality for the fleets down the line that I believe this wholeheartedly. I believe in what I'm doing with my mission. Okay. Uh, I love coming out with my Sunday videos. I look forward to it. It's stuff that builds up over the week. I don't release highly on videos every day and I refuse to do that. But if I can come out with these offerings every single week and offer what it is that I feel is the top of the iceberg for the topic at hand, then I think we can as a group, not an individual, but as a group, further discussion along. So the technology is number two on the list. Number three is the financials. And I think sometimes highly on, well, I know it takes a black eye for coming out of the SPAC process. You have to remember that the SPAC process is unlike any other process uh, in bringing companies to public markets, but banks would be salivating to provide financing to an opportunity like Hylion with the landscape that we have and moving toward an electrified future to provide the funding that they already have on the books and they don't get any credit for it. The books are fabulous, okay? Hylion has all kinds of cash on the books. They've got 550 in cash, about 200 and what, 280 million, something like that. Last time I checked, uh, short-term investments, which will help fund the uh, cost of operations and long-term investments. So totaling about 550 million, all generated from the SPAC process. So it provided that funding uh, through that SPAC process to provide the pipe funding necessary for them to execute along their business plan. Guys, this isn't so far removed of what companies look to do. Raise capital, monitor cash burn, make sure that they're hitting that critical mass break even. The delay will not help Hylion. It will not. Getting through this 18 months, man, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's going to be easy. Uh, I hope that it is. <laughs> I hope that it is, uh, but what in the hell with this stock has been easy up to this point? I'll wait, right? It's been a grind and I don't expect the next 18 months to be any easier, okay? So where the stock goes, I have no idea. I think stepping into 2023, I think the stock will do what it's gonna do, but I'd love to see it settle out above $10 before the end of the year. I'd like to see that. Whether or not it happens or not, whether or not it ends up at three or eight 
or six or five or four and a half is really kind of irrelevant at this point because I've put that uh, short-term roadmap into the future here as a bridging cycle. Now, we have identifiable road marks or, or uh, um, milestones that we will meet over this 18 months. Now, whether or not we meet these milestones and we meet full CARB and MIPSA uh, certification, and it does not provide any type of catalyst for the stock, is that going to surprise me? No, no. Nothing as of yet has provided any type of spark or catalyst for, for the stock as of late. Everything falls on deaf ears. Doesn't matter what the company does. Doesn't matter what any company does right now. With the stock market volatility, I'm actually surprised that Hylion is holding in right here. It's actually up month over month and nobody's talking about it. Nobody. Think I'm lying? Check the month over month right during this video or shortly after and, and check it. I'm right. Um, I'm always right with my statistics because I'm right on the money. Uh, and I usually understand that if I'm talking about it and nobody else is talking about it, th that right there is where I'm best in the pocket because that's where money's made. Money's made right there in the pocket. When nobody's talking about an opportunity, this company right now at $3, nobody's talking about it. I think it's lovely. I think it's wonderful. I think as it goes up, $4, $5, $6, 7 8 maybe, maybe it ends the years at 10 12 there will be more discussion then than there is right now. You explain the fallacy in that application, okay? I think it's, pro I think it's problematic to overlook it now. I think we do have time. Um, I, I think the stock, the reason why I'm invested in it now is because I've seen too many times where companies like this that have a wonderful idea that will eventually find their place uh, will gap up. And that's what's going to happen. Uh, mark my word, it'll gap up. This is a question that I would ask Thomas Healy about. And I would frame it in a way to say, Thomas, do you know what a gap up is? You know what a gap up is in a stock where the stock shoots up after hours and opens up the next morning, let's say up six, seven, eight dollars from where it is right now. The question and framing it to Thomas Healy would be like, do you have the firepower or the catalyst to spur that type of, of gap up in the market. And I would suggest that perhaps maybe because you have not shared that information, that you just don't have it at this point, that we are privy to everything going on right now that is publicly discernible out in the marketplace. It's an interesting challenge to the boss, right? To, to say, do you have anything up your sleeve? Do you have discussions going on with the big companies, Amazon, has Green Path Logistics provided any type of referral business to those larger fleets out there outside of your Hypertruck Innovation Council? Has there been any work internally with the Hypertruck Innovation Council? Uh, have you heard anything other than nothing from Ruan? Big fleet, haven't heard a word about it. They're named on the Innovation Council. And it doesn't mean that there's not discussions going on. It doesn't mean that they won't provide value. It's just myself as a shareholder sitting back and looking at this opportunity, where's the goods? And so that's how I would frame that question to, to say, look, is this company capable of a gap up? Yes, I believe that it is. That's why I'm investing in the company now. Uh, I've bought, I bought at the 268. I bought long calls at 268 at $3 strike. Um, so I'm buying at these levels. No problem. Could it go lower? Yeah. Could it gap up? Yeah. I win in either case. Yes. Understand my rationale a little bit. So financials is number three when we're talking about the bullish thesis. And not to mention that something that plagues most companies now is the amount of debt. Hylion has no debt on the books. Big deal, Ryan. It's not a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Because if this company has the ability to go from that baseline off the launching pad that I talked about, zero, they're at 170, 2000, maybe they transition part or all of those into orders, they're halfway home for that first launching pad year of getting back to that break even, 130, 135, 150 million in, in top end revenue, right? To cover the cost of operations and really set themselves up to make a big push into the fleet. That's when I think the domino effect is going to start and the uh, viability of this product is going to actually be realized amongst the fleets and really <laughs> realize what we're all talking about here. The fleets don't care about going green on its, on its own. 
they don't care. <laughs> Look at the status quo. They run diesel. They only care about efficiency. Now, if they can go green without, at, without ex, at the expense of efficiency, then they'll do that. But to suggest somehow that they're just going to throw all of it out the window for the sake to just go H2, a new technology that is unproven. Uh, it's unproven. Um, compressed natural gas is the most proven outside of diesel. Everything else, no, it's not proven. And that's why I tried to talk and I left a good comment on Paul's channel on his latest video um, discussing this very fact. I think it's of interest to me how everybody's calling winners right now. Nikola will be the winner for this reason and that reason. Hylion will not be the winner because Nikola is doing certain things, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I don't think so. I think all of these companies are going to incur shortcoming. I do. All of them. Nikola, Hyzon, look at Rivian. Just recalled a bunch of vehicles here because they blasted them out too fast. And oh my goodness, lo and behold, right? They were trying to hit that sweet spot of pushing and being aggressive and it bit them. And now they're having to recall, start from the drawing board. This happened to Tesla many, many times along their push, 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 and drive. Hylion is throttling their opportunity to move as fast as they are allowed to move and as fast as the supply chain will allow them to move. And perhaps maybe with some of the FEV validation, certainly, and the Hypertruck Innovation Council, the ride and drives, and the fleet integration that seems to be a lot more prevalent uh, with Hylion than it is with Nikola, okay? Th that's a fair observation in my mind in that it just seems like Nikola is going about this and saying, here's our solution, integrate, no matter what, okay? We're going to dealers. The dealers have to sell the fleets, okay? Will those sales, will those point of sales happen? I don't know. Hylion's asking industry, what do you need? What do you need? And I, I don't believe that Hylion would exist if there wasn't a quantifiable need that was communicated back to Hylion on the very need that the fleets are asking for. Do you think that there's a potential maybe there that the fleet said, hey, we want to keep our existing Peterbilt truck? We want to keep it. If you can fix the guts where it matters, we want to keep the truck. It, 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 are aesthetics important? I don't know. Some would suggest that it doesn't matter. You're going to drive some spaceship looking thing into the charging station and, and charge your, your uh, uh, spaceship looking Nikola truck uh, at the charging station or fuel up when there's other rigs there being charged up with another alternative fuel that by some suggestions are going to just go away. They're going to vanish. No, I don't. But do aesthetics matter? <laughs> Guys, bears are going to be like, you're, you're wrong, Ryan. You're completely wrong. I don't know. Let's defer to the truckers. Do aesthetics matter? Is, is, is there something to be said about driving the most popular truck on the road right now, which is the Peterbilt uh, edition, the one that they've partnered with to turn out the Hypertruck ERX on the onset? Oh, I think they matter. And I think they matter in a big, big way. And I think we're going to find out in 18 short months just how much it actually matters when those rigs are being integrated by the fleets because they understand that they don't need to change that part of the truck. They just need to change the very efficiency piece to the drivetrain and look to go electrified without changing anything else. Okay. Very, very important when we're talking about that. All right. Number four on the bullish conviction is the performance piece. Okay. I came across to Twitter and I retweeted, if you guys don't follow me on Twitter, please kick over there. Just, just follow me just for my tweets because I'm funny. I'm scathing. Um, I call BS on a lot. And this was one of our dividend kings, Cisco, which was brought up as a company that we thought highly on should go after. And um, I still think that they should go after, but they just signed for 800 units of their uh, Freightliner E Cascadia which gets all of about 230 miles of range. That's with their larger battery. They get about 180 miles of range with their smaller battery. Uh, I can repeat 230 with their larger with a 90 minute charge time. And my tweet was, did the world get dumber? Okay. Hylion boasts 
a thousand miles on their range extender vehicle. Now the bears, even Paul has fallen into this idea that they don't get this because they don't prove that they can get that. Fair enough. It's just as much to suggest that maybe they're telling the truth, then they're lying and saying that it's a liar, liar, pants on fire type of thing, and that they can only realize 500. I don't know. know? But I have no reason to believe that the horsepower isn't there. The range isn't there. They've been steadfast on this to get up to 1,000 miles with the range that's powered by CNG uh, on the Hypertruck ERX. I have no reason to believe that they can't get that type of efficiency. And if they can, we are talking about a, a performance metric that does not even compare to what industry is looking to uh, 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 seek out because they're hungry. So I think when we're talking about the performance piece, what if they do meet this thousand? What, what if it's a, a more? What if it's more? And it's becoming validated over and over and over again amongst the fleets. What if, it, what if they fall completely short and it ends up being a range of 800 miles? That's still far superior to anything in the industry. I think that's going to be a real black eye for Hylion. I tell you what, and it's going to be a real disappointment for me specifically, because I tell you what, this investor community has been jerked around so many times and has been asked to adjust and adjust uh, uh, to the right, shift to the right so many times on timelines that if some of these very things that have been steadfast from the beginning don't end up uh, coming to fruition with regard to the performance factor with Hylion, then it, it's just going to draw them closer to the competition and make it seem like they are less ahead of the pack, which I believe that they are. A lot of people are saying Hylion is behind the curve in, in, uh, in the competition race. I don't, I don't think so at all. I don't. I think we're in the beginning innings uh, of this very step into different solutions and finding out where those solutions are going to be the best fit all along the transportation nexus, not just in the class eight space, but finding out that maybe Nikola isn't the best fit for class eight and maybe is a better fit for the mid tier uh, type of uh, applications and maybe even the lower end uh, with Hyzon uh, and, and maybe vice versa. Maybe there's dual use cases for, for each. Maybe there's certain geographic locations that are more conducive to certain solutions than others. We're going to find that out over the coming years, guys. The question is, who's going to be involved? My contention is that all of these companies are going to be around. The, the golden question is, in what capacity? That, that's the question that we all need to be asking about. You can go as far as the extremes, and the extremes for me is to invest or not to invest. Those are the extremes, okay? You can have an opinion. You can have a, a, a scrutiny. Um, you could be one of those people that want to see highly on burn in hell because they've lost you money, okay? You can be part of the discussion without either owning or not owning the stock, but those are the two extremes, okay? The extreme is I've done my due diligence on the company and I pledge X number of dollars toward that company by becoming an investor in the company. That's the extreme right there. Okay. And then everything in between is really just what makes up the discussion in the community. Okay. But when we're talking about performance, I don't think there's any deniability with regard to the uh, on par uh, charging burden on the drivers when we're going to CNG equivalent to diesel. Yes. The thousand miles of range that we're looking at looking to get more validation on that. This is where I do agree with Paul. Um, I disagree where, when he says that they're keeping it a secret or they're, they're keeping things conveniently uh, from invest that, that I just, I don't agree with that. I, there's, there's reasons why there's institutions that hold millions and millions of shares in this company right now. And I think in due time, it means more to me to have that validated over the road than for Nicola to put it on their website. Because in, with all due respect, Nicola has had a pretty spotty track record of providing concrete information to would-be shareholders, yes, in their past. So I'll believe it when I see it, okay? And I would rather believe it when I see it as opposed to seeing a figure on a website and making my extreme conviction based on what I see from that said website. Number five, to suggest somehow that the infrastructure does not matter right now, I beg to differ. 
Okay. We are talking about 5% of a $1 trillion industry that is enjoying CNG as we speak. This is the reality. Now there are, just like I believe there will be shortcomings, which with all of the technologies, we've, this whole discussion is built around identifying the shortcoming with what is now dominated by 95% of the industry. And that is diesel. It's pollutive characteristics. That's what we're talking about. Okay. But to somehow suggest that the infrastructure that exists, um, there was a, a comment made, I think Paul talked about this, where his thesis was that CNG initiative was slowing down or coming to a halt in some locations, especially the Southern California area. And although I cannot dispute that in the Southern California area, I would point out there that um, California is a utopia. Okay. And drawing your distinctions based on said utopia and how they are going to transcend to both the domestic market here, uh, both rural uh, and in the cities. Okay. And from a geographic perspective is, is short-sighted. He knows this. Okay. He's a smart guy. He knows this. But I, I think to suggest that through a video, through social media, just to fit the narrative that somehow compressed natural gas will not have its place in the transportation sector because H2 on the books is a better solution. It's a better solution from the niche of going all green. That I agree. Is it greener of a solution than compressed natural gas? Sure, it is. It is. That is not the standalone driver that is going to sell fleets on looking at the totality of what is available and what type of efficiencies can they drive in meeting that end. That's the key. Okay. It's not, we're going to buy into this. And I hate to use the term, but I'm going to use it because it fits the tree hugger mentality. I want to save the planet too. A lot of people who are interested in this space are interested in cleaning up a very dirty space right now. It's dirty, okay? Tree huggers don't care if, if fleets stay in business. They don't care. Come on now. All they care about is protecting the planet, okay? And folks like myself and people who are re realists would suggest that tree huggers also like to get their goods at Walmart and they are pissed off just like everybody else when they show up and those said goods are not on the shelves for them to conveniently purchase, okay? Because they're so far along this niche of being green that it has to go green at the expense of everything else. This has been a futile effort, futile effort across this landscape for the last two decades where industry just has not had the technology and they've been able to very, very easily shun off the efforts of said tree huggers to go green or buy into some sort of a green initiative because the efficiencies just aren't there on the bottom line, okay? So the bullish conviction here is CNG is being noted as a bridge fuel, okay? You can dispute me all you want. I'm sure there's people who just downright hate me for coming on and just sharing my opinion through a social media network. I'm not a bad guy, okay? If you want to deem me as such, go ahead. But CNG is being noted as a bridge fuel. If by nature of seeking that path to a hydrogen future, CNG is how we're going to get there. And it's going to be getting there in a matter of trial and error. CNG works for certain routes. It works better than H2. It works better than diesel. If we can go all the way to hydrogen and plus up from diesel, now that's a win for everybody, even the tree huggers. All right. What I'm suggesting is that H2 as a dominant source of moving transportation goods from point A to point B in the class eight space is unrealistic. And I'd like people to challenge me on that. If you honestly believe that H2 is going to dominate the class eight space into the future, if you believe that they're going to dominate by 50% or 25% or 10% or supplement C and G altogether at a whopping 5% clip, I would love to hear your arguments. We've been having this argument for the last three decades 
and nary have they found even 1% of market penetration with regard to hydrogen fuel cell. Tree huggers want to blame it on Exxon. Fair enough. I just want to speak to the bottom line and yield to the bean counters with the fleets and suggest that maybe they know what they're doing to drive efficiency within the, each of their operations. And they've opted for diesel as opposed to a hydrogen future up to this point. I'm not suggesting that we don't have a hydrogen future, but to what extent is really where the conversation should lie. What percentage of the uh, class eight space is going to be consumed by a hydrogen future? I don't know. Now we're starting the discussion towards something that is meaningful, but somehow to suggest that CNG is dirty and because it comes from the earth, it is unusable. And because it comes from the earth that somehow it's going to be problematic to transport said fuel to the fueling stations. This exists. Whether or not you want to acknowledge it or not, it exists. And it is available at the pump right now. And to misconstrue the price right now of compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas to the price at the pump is a real fallacy. Price at the pump in some places in this country are as low as 25 cents right now on the high end, $2.25. These are the facts. On an average, Thomas Healy is saying that it's about a dollar on an average, $1 at the pump. Compared to diesel right now, these fleets are taking it in the shorts. And they're probably not very interested in an argument to say that you can go with this H2 vision into the future. But oh, by the way, you only have a certain number of opportunities to fuel your rig. And to suggest that there is something uh, something contrary to that argument uh, is a, a little bit imaginative, in my opinion. Okay. The state and local, state and national mandates with regard to the ZEV credits and the advanced clean fleet. Guys, this is bullish for Hylion. And I find it interesting how these people who suggest that there is no bullish information on Hylion right now is, is, is somehow um, not focusing on these initiatives, both the OEM mandates with the ZEV credits, as well as the advanced clean fleet, where these fleets are going to be mandated to integrate part of their fleet with uh, cleaner technology. What those solutions are, it's going to be up to the fleets. They're going to be up to the fleets. What does it speak to? It speaks to an industry that is shaping up. The stars are aligning to be eventually looking at these solutions and identifying which solution is going to be best for their operation. I'll be on board for that. I really will. Uh, and if I had an inkling right now, I would just go buy, go ahead and buy Hyzon at these depressed levels as well and just own the entire space as far as I'm concerned. Because I think the technology and the fuels that each of these niches represent uh, is exciting from a value proposition. I'm a value investor. Um, will it happen 11 days from now? I, I don't know. Maybe. Will it happen a year from now? Probably more likely than 11 days. Will it happen two years from now? Probably more likely than one year from now. Become an investor. It's a beautiful thing. Once you turn over the script a little bit and stop worrying about all the wishy-washy back and forth retail bullshit minutia that we get caught in all of the time and start to think for yourself about, is Hylion going to be a $3 stock next year? Is it going to be going out of business? There would be some people that suggest that they're going out of business. This is not going to find a spot. The building that they occupy, the 200 employees that they've grown to is going to dissolve away. I've gone through this analogy before. I'll go through it again because it's fun. Uh, the very efficiencies that um, they are looking to exploit, a thousand miles, the very prototypes that are, in fact, providing ride and drive testimonials for fleets right now. All of that's going to go away. The cash is somehow going to just dissolve away and they're automatically just going to incur 25 million in debt, 50 million in debt, 100 million in debt, declare bankruptcy, dilute shareholders. All that's going to happen. It's going to happen. Okay. In investing, anything can happen. And the reason why I throw that out there on a video for you guys to consume free of charge is that I don't stray away from the sheer reality of investing reality of investing is it can go either way. Put your conviction where it may lie. And in each of the extremes, either buy or don't buy the stock based on your extreme conviction over the company. Or if you like being in the middle and you like being in the discussion because it intrigues you, 
great. You can find your spot in this community all the same. Uh, so the state and national mandates I identified as one of those uh, bullish convictions uh, on, on the company here. Uh, number seven is their business plan and approach, okay? When you're bullish on Nikola and you talk about a plant that went from dust to reality so quickly, I would be careful with deeming that a bullish sign of uh, the company in way of justifying your position in the stock. Mm -hmm. So when I speak with Nikola investors, they have no idea where the margins are with the company. They have no idea. They have no idea what type of CapEx this is going to create for them. They have no idea of how much bottom line profit they're going to be able to generate. They're going to be able to sell units. Okay. They may be able to sell units, but they're going to have to sell a lot of units because they run on a capital intensive model. Hylion runs on a capital lean model. The difference between these two are astronomical. Okay. My bearish conviction on Hylion is what if Peterbilt just throws the towel in and no more Hylion? What happens? Scary question. Yeah. I'd ask the boss, but do I think that's going to happen? No, I don't. I think there's benefit to the OEMs to actually meeting their OEM mandates, to have those solutions that they feel like they can be collaborative with. And Hylion is collaborative with Peterbilt. They've been with them since the beginning. I have no reason to believe that this business plan cannot come to fruition into the future and have Hylion grab an, an interesting part of, it doesn't change anything for Peterbilt. They're still going to turn out 40,000 units from the line, right? It's just, if it do they, if, if they do opt for the 90, a hundred thousand uh, dollar upgrade to the Hypertruck ERX, then Hylion will benefit from that upgrade. Everybody wins. The fleet mandates win, the OEM mandates win, Hylion wins, and little investors that could, like the independent man, the little feller, Deller Heller, that's given you this weekly update on, on uh, Hylion, also does benefit. Yes, it's like Paul says, uh, I'm in it for the money. <laughs> that's funny. I, of course I'm in it for the money. I don't, I don't, I don't invest for any other reason. Uh, I want to make money. But again, it's the means to that end that needs to be kept in check uh, and making sure that maybe you enjoy the ride a little bit, enjoy um, the um, enjoy the ability to participate in financial markets in the capacity that we do. It's a special thing, guys. It really is. Um, Hylion will be there in the future, okay? It's a question of whether or not you want to be there along for the ride or not. Make your decision. Now's the time, man. It's all good. I'm still smiling. $3, $10, $19 doesn't make that damn bit of difference to me where this stock is over the coming months. I want to be there for every milestone that Hylion has to turn out. I'm going to accumulate shares where I can. I'm going to do it smartly. I'm not going to YOLO my entire retirement into Hylion. I'm not going to do that. Um, less than 8% of my total portfolio value is in the company right now. Um, I'm satisfied with that position. And, and I'm willing to allow things to unfold where they are inevitably going to unfold too. I'm happy with it, okay? But to suggest somehow that the business plan and approach from a conservative manner, no debt, already talked about the financials, but to integrate with the OEMs and maybe even knock off multiple OEMs into the future, that's going to be huge. You talk about grabbing that 5,000 critical mass break even for units sold in the Hypertruck ERX. We're not even talking about other use cases, guys. We're talking about making it on the Hypertruck ERX alone, if they can get to that 5,000 critical mass break even, we're talking about a, 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 at least a $25, maybe even a $50 stock, depending on the mul multiple that's fixed the company. Because we're talking about a company at that time that if they haven't diluted sharehold, uh, shareholders and they haven't taken on new debt, um, they are going to release that share float that is still uh, looming. Uh, but we need to get the share price up a little bit, needs to get to that point where they are looking to expand operations. Uh, and then it's going to be um, uh, a well-received type of, uh, it'll be a release of the share float, basically, that's been in uh, holding since the, uh, the SPAC era. Um, but right now with the existing share float, we're talking about you know, a company that's 25 to 50 uh, with a nice technological or even industrial multiple uh, fixed to it. Um, and then, you know, if they end up doing 
the five to 10,000, we're talking about a hundred and a quarter. We're talking about a hundred, $125 stock right here, 16 to $18 billion market cap. It's just that simple. It's not my, it's, it's math. It's not hard. Uh, very, very simple. Be honest with you. This is the easy part about investing. It's not the hard part is in the trenches. It's it. The hard part is holding true on an investment where others, most others would fail. Um, Having a vision for the future, not necessarily judging a company wholeheartedly to make an extreme decision on a company based solely on past performance. That's investing 101. That's the tricky part. Um, companies $100, we're talking about a $16 billion company. That's easy, right? Will they get there? I don't know. I don't know. You're off. You're bad, Ryan. You're a bad fellow. You're a bad person, Ryan. Okay, I'm a bad person. I'll remind you, you said that when it gets there. Okay. Number eight, driver satisfaction. This is a bullish uh, thing. Uh, these ride and drives, actually, I thought ride and drive, like, this is kind of stupid. Um, when I heard Thomas Healy talk about it, I was like, I don't know, how about we sell units? And how about you be more um, forward? And I think their PR has improved a lot. I, I think some, some of us and Paul still, I was very, very scrutinizing on the company last fall. Um, I caught a lot of heat for it. That's fine. No problem. You can give as much heat to me as you want. I'm going to do what I want when I want, how I want. Um, they weren't, they weren't uh, being transparent enough. Um, I feel like they're being transparent right now. I think they're doing a great job. I, I don't feel like if, if they don't have anything to share right now, I, I don't need to see little tidbits here and there. I want to see good information when it's happening. I want to understand that the company's working hard behind the scenes. And when there's information to be released, release the information. I'm good with it. Okay. But the driver satisfaction and what has been garnered from the ride and drives has told me that the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. Hmm. Overwhelmingly positive. So the company's going bankrupt and they're going to dilute shareholders and they're just going out of business and all highly on investors are going to see the company and it's going to cease to exist. And Nicola's going to grab a hundred percent market share and Hyzon is going to share in that hundred percent. Each of them are going to own 125% of the addressable market. It's not even possible, but that's all right. We could just make up stuff because Highland's going out of business, right? Because nobody likes the product. I said on my live stream, I said, if nobody, if somebody got in the truck and said, I'm not feeling it, Thomas, I, I don't get it, man, this is really loud. You know, Thomas is always like, did you hear the generator kick on? And everybody's like, no. He's like, yeah, it just kicked on. It's got a 30 minute kind of where the phase needs to start. And then it'll start charging the batteries. No, everybody's like, wow, that's so quiet. It's such a far cry from diesel, such a far cry from diesel. Why? Because diesel's not really that important in this equation. Is that what you're saying, Ryan? So we shouldn't look at Hylion as an opportunity because diesel doesn't need to be uh, supplemented or augmented as, uh, as identifying alternative niches in this industry, right? We just need to keep the status quo and continue to be reliant upon diesel that's going above $6 a gallon and be at the whims of OPEC and Russia and all these other countries that basically own us. All right, maybe we can do that. Sure. Hi, Leon's going to zero again. No, just kidding. I mean, you see my point, right? Kind of interesting when we talk about it in that light. Really, it just comes down to efficiency, guys. It comes down to reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. That's how. It, that's what it comes down to. But when we're talking about bullish thesis on Hylian, I think it is important to note the driver satisfaction that is going to hope. Does it have a potential to attract new talent? Yeah, it does. Does it have a, a potential to attract new people looking for employment? Um, all these people who have been looking to fire and retire early over the last couple of years because they thought that the stock market was going to be their meal ticket to retirement. Um, I think maybe some of those people are going to get kicked in the teeth and they're going to realize that working is probably your best way to carve out a nominal lifestyle in this life and that not everybody is going to be a multimillionaire into their future. And that hard reality is going to come to fruition over the next coming months when we enter into a recession in this country and people are looking for employment out there. And for those young drivers out there that are tree huggers, they do care about the environment. They've brought up, been brought up to really acknowledge and do everything that they can possibly do to support the environment, not to support those industries that have been built and predicated upon burning fossil fuels and polluting our earth. 
bringing in driver talent is huge here when they can know that they're behind the wheel of something that is forward thinking, something that is marching toward a greener, a greener future. The more the rig is driven, the better off the planet will, will be, specifically speaking about RNG. Okay. Very important. Number nine, spoke about this a little bit. Bullish conviction, number nine, Hylion's integration initiative. Um, this is something that I would commend Thomas Healy on. I think it's been kind of one of those things that have been steadfast all the way along in that they did not want to come to the table and bring a solution forward that they felt like they were working on parallel paths with uh, industry or even converging paths. Okay. And what I mean by that is I think the collaborative approach that Hylian has taken has been a very, very smart approach. I, I think this is going to pay dividends down the line. Is it paying dividends now? No, Hylian doesn't pay a dividend, but it certainly has a recessed stock price at $3 a share. Okay. But when we're talking about um, the feedback that's going to come from fleet demos, I don't see where Nickel is doing anything of the sort. Okay. And Hylion, think about this from this perspective. If they didn't have a product that they were proud of, do you honestly think that they would subject it to the rigors of over the road class eight transport when they know that negative feedback is going to the be the demise of the very company that they are looking to build up? Yep. That was a pretty cool thing I just said, if you think about it. Yeah. Be like shooting themselves in the foot, right? They're going to subject a product that they know can't meet that thousand dollar validation or thousand mile validation. You think that they would do that? You think that they're going to subject a Hypertruck ERX prototype demo unit to the Innovation Council, that of which they've come forward and said, we are putting this unit into your fleets, but we're putting it into your fleets full well knowing that the driver ex experience has been mixed. It's been 50-50. Do you think they would do that? Do you think that they're willing to accept the negative backlash that they would receive by putting those demo units into the hands of the fleets and not expecting nothing but positive feedback? Areas of improvement? Absolutely. Any areas of improvement on an internal audit, which this basically is, that the company is putting their product in the hands of industry and soliciting, almost begging for that feedback, is going to come. I, I want it. I'm a shareholder. I want that feedback. I do not want them to come back and say, it's perfect. Let's go to mass scale. And, and, and nobody, Rick, who's with me on this, all of the folks in the Discord, they're, they've got to be with me on this, man. If they're not, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn a blind eye. All right. <laughs> we want feedback. It's a good thing. And we're going to subject these demo units to the fleets and we're going to expect that critical feedback to come back based on demographic, based on geographic, based on climate, uh, based on driver tendencies, all kinds of cool stuff. There'll be stuff that comes back that Hylion could not foresee, that FEV in the product internal validation could not foresee. This is going to be huge. And I think this is an approach that gets missed. Is it valued in the stock price? Hell no. Hell no. Stock price is undervalued right now. Let's be real. Stock price is uh, highly on right now is oh, still overvalued. No, it's not using the wrong metric. Using the wrong metric. Pull head out of ass. Go value Procter & Gamble because that's the value metric that you're using. You cannot use uh, the fact that they don't have sales right now to value the opportunity that exists with this company because you're going to be forced to use the same validation that I used when sales are articulatable, okay, and are quantifiable to, to come to the same $50 price target and $100 price target and $125 price targets that I'm using. I just don't value the company that way right now because they don't have any sales. Okay, let's be real. Let's be fair. Let's be fair, okay? But the internal validation, man, that is going to pay dividends into the future in that fleets are going to know what they're going to get when they enter into mass scale up. Number 10. Number 10 for a bullish thesis. And I want to bring it home. Um, I thought about it. I, I watched Paul's video and he would be happy to know. And I don't know if he watches my highly on videos anymore. I hope he does. I hope he does. I, I, I think he senses the same thing I sense in him and that I'm not quick to judge on YouTube. Let's be real. Y'all that are viewing this and have viewed it for the entire totality of this video, you don't know me. You don't know me. 
I don't know you. Um, you're consuming this content for your own selfish benefit. Um, I'm good at this. You will benefit from this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do I feel like at some point in the future, this is a moneymaker? I do. I'm convicted on it. I don't have to share my story with you. <laughs> I don't have to. Um, I could just go on being an investor in this company with no problem and do other things with my time on a Sunday, every single hour for 60 minutes minimum when I come on and talk about this. Why do I do that? Why don't I do 12 minute highly on videos? They're boring. I don't, I don't get to actually communicate what we need to do, uh, discuss with this topic because we are at the impasse of history right now where niches and solutions are coming to bear. So my 10th bullish conviction, and I really want you to think about this, is who will eventually win out? And I know this is being projected in some lights that, and this is the impression that I've got off of the last few videos that I've watched of Paul, in that he wants to say, it's going to be this, 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 and this, but I'm not bashing on this over here. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you kind of are. You kind of are. And it's okay. Everybody's entitled to the, their opinion. He doesn't need to be so apologetic. I watch his videos with my lens, okay? And I, I appreciate the efforts. Um, I don't understand the banter back and forth with the Discord. I'm in the Discord. I support it. I think if you want to get in there and get, yeah, some bullish information on the company, I don't think there's any harm in that. Um, I'm bullish on this opportunity. There's no doubt about it. Uh, me and hi, Leon, we're of like mind. I'm pointing to my bull, uh, Leon. Um, if you want to say hi, you got to come into the live stream and say hi. I'm not going to share it now. But um, I'm bullish on this opportunity. I'm excited. I'm excited about this opportunity that I believe fleets are looking at this opportunity. If you believe that Hylion is running in quicksand right now and they're going too slow, I think that's a really, really surface level observation right now. I think because the more accelerated you choose to run in this game, the more chances that you have of, of uh, incurring mishap, misstep, things that could have been prevented by taking your time, things that could have been prevented by spending a few months on fleet demo and rollout, something that Thomas Healy has been steadfast this whole time on. Very, very simple, okay? And I think when we're questioning on who will win in, into the future, I think we need to stop speaking so definitively about this company will win and this company won't, or this company sucks, because I think those opinions are generated specifically, and if not entirely exclusively on the stock action day to day, really. And this, again, I'm going to tell you to grow a pair, honestly, because retail investors are, they're, they're pussies and they need to, they need to suck it up because coming up with your thesis and saying that the company sucks or whatever it is, it's not going to make it or whatever other dumb idiotic things. If you want to know a good sample set of these dumb and idiotic projections, just go into the Yahoo thread uh, for Hylion, which I bash all the time. It's a cesspool. Um, and the king cesspool leader in there is anonymous. He's cordially invited to my live stream when this company does actually do something other than go down. So I will agree with him in the short term, and I will grin a little bit in the short term and suggest that if you are right, my friend, then the company will remain at three or dissolve away altogether. If that's your bet, no problem. If you're wrong and the company does end up going up, show some balls and come onto my live stream, man, when it does decide to go up, and then you can defend your conviction now. But he's the king cesspool. You want to go in there and find all these idiotic things about the company, you can go in there and find all kinds of stupid things. Um, it's um, king, king, king moronism. It's the uh, land of the lemmings for retail investor community. Most of the would-be investors that I know that are savvy and understand this opportunity, they've gone away from there anyway, me included. It's not that, you know, we're embarrassed to go in there. It's just a waste of time. What is important to understand is who will come out of this? Is it going to be all of them? Is it going to be none of them? Is it going to be some of them? Is it only going to be Nicola and not Hylion? I think the solution is much more simple than that. And here's what I'm going to leave you with. All of these companies are going to have a piece of this market all of them. I'm not saying that to give you my opinion. I'm not saying that to convince you of one thing or another. 
but my job is to be as forthcoming as I can with what I think is going to roll out in the future and put ourselves at a decision five years from now to look back and say, man, alive, we had it right there. We knew Hyzon was a good company. We knew Nikola was making strides and we knew Hylion was exploiting their niche. We had it right there and we let it slip away. So when we're looking at the bullish thesis, don't look at it from a perspective of just Hylion. Don't look at it from a perspective of just Hyzon or Nikola or Tesla. Look at it from the perspective of the time and shift in the time that we are in right now and how receptive, I believe, contrary to past involvement with the fleets, how interested they are in making these shifts, how the federal and local governments are mandating that this shift happen. The question is, in what capacity will these companies enjoy, in whatever capacity, the niche that they're looking to evolve right now into our future to a march to a greener future down the line. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message. If you enjoy the channel, man, you want to make sure and subscribe to the channel. Leave your comments at the bottom of the video. I always enjoy the banter that's generated from the Highland discussion. It's very emotionally charged. I totally get a lot of people have lost a lot of money. <laughs> I suggest uh, going back and reviewing that part that I gave on becoming an investor. It's not easy. If it were easy, everybody would do it. And the sheer reality is that 98% of people who do investing fail at investing. There's a reason. I'm looking to penetrate through and identify in that top 2%, what is the pedigree that allows you to make it in this game? Make it. And I say all the time, following in this opportunity as difficult as it might be could be a very very lucrative proposition and looking at the opportunity that is unfolding before our eyes every single day as we march toward mass scale and commercialization in this opportunity guys thank you so much for remaining with me through the totality of the video and good luck in your investment future